Welcome to Sliceonomics. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon. Sliceonomics is a podcast that focuses on the complexity of economics, media, culture, and looks at it through a human-focused lens. The goal is to look beyond the numbers and into the nebulous of everyday lives and how they're shaped by these big thematics around us. Sliceonomics is in co-production with Public.com, an investing platform that allows people to invest in stocks, ETFs, treasuries, crypto, art collectibles, and more all in one place. Scan the QR code right here on the screen or check out the link in the episode description box to learn more. Today, we're speaking with David Dayan, executive editor of The American Prospect. He is the author of Monopolized, Life in the Age of Corporate Power, and Chain of Title, How Three Ordinary Americans Uncovered Wall Street's Great Foreclosure Fraud. Dayan is a former stand-up comic and writes about politics, the economy, media, and more. So, hey, David, it's so great to have you here. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah. So I also had sort of a backwards path to Los Angeles, and I arrived from Kentucky. And I know you took kind of a similar route, um, making your way to L.A. Can you talk about your path uh, to where you are and where you were and where you are now. Um, and I'm curious how your work in the entertainment industry shaped the work that you do today around politics and such. Sure. So as you said, my, I, I kind of came into journalism through the side door. Um, I was in television, both producing and then later on uh, in post-production editing uh, for television, film, music videos, uh, what have you. And uh, I got interested in political blogging uh, really right at the outset of it. If you were a blogger, somebody who was writing about politics online in 2002 or 2003, you were part of kind of a small group uh, and you were able to sort of rise through the ranks such that it was. And uh, that's what I did and uh, got involved with a bunch of different uh, group blogs and uh, uh culminating in Fire Dog Lake from uh, 2009 to 2012, um, which kind of set me on this path. I was still editing throughout that whole time. Uh, I would just sort of, you know, blog a little bit and then edit a little bit. And by the end, I was, you know, doing more, more blogging than editing. Um, but, uh, you know, do I think that that helped prepare me? Yes. I mean, I think it's all storytelling. Um, you're trying to get your uh, viewpoint uh, over to the reader uh, or the viewer in uh, a way that's coherent, in a way that's lucid, in a way that, that is understandable. Um, you want to structure stories in certain ways. So, yes, I think that, uh, you know, that did help me uh, in, in terms of how to think about structuring uh, uh, articles and things like that. So I know you used to do stand-up. Um, do your stand-up sets sort of mimic how you write articles? Like, do you structure them in a similar way? Uh, well, it's been a while, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I was I was kind of a politically aware uh, person when I was doing comedy, and so a lot of those bits have have that kind of involved in them. And uh, you know, there's 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 obviously a difference between you know bits where you do a setup and a punchline and then some sort of longer thing where you're trying to explain uh, a segment of the economy to somebody. There's, there's certainly yeah. a, a different uh, way of, of, uh, of, of taking a look at that. But uh, I think what is the same is that uh, you're, you're, you're trying to make sure that the audience is along for the ride with you. Um, and whether that's a premise uh, that uh, you're trying to get out in a humorous way or whether that's uh, trying to, to figure out some kind of operatic thing about derivatives or, or uh, you know, uh, housing futures or whatever, um, I, I think that, that there are similarities there in uh, getting buy-in, getting trust from an audience uh, uh, and having the confidence to see it through. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that is about managing emotions too. So as a writer and as somebody who's writing about these like big economic topics and political topics as well, um, how do you think that people are feeling about their current financial situation and has that evolved since the beginning of the year and what you've seen? Yeah. So, I mean, we're in a very 
tricky time, I think, uh, for the economy uh, and ways in ways that aren't fully intuitive. I mean, if you would look at uh, people had a great degree of household savings uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic, because we did a lot to uh, fill people's pockets when they weren't uh, able to work or able to go to work. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at the statistics, uh, there was uh, major increases in savings, particularly at the low end, and that has dissipated over the last couple of years. So you would think that there would be, uh, and certainly combined with inflation, you would think there would be a lot of anxiety. But the other half of that, which is a little more, I think, emotional, as you put it, is the fact that people feel like they lost out on a couple years of their life and they want to uh, remedy that in some way. We have seen these huge concerts that have come out this year uh, with even though the prices are going up, they're sold out. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Bruce Springsteen, what have you. We've seen these uh, uh, blockbuster movie events, the Barbenheimer kind of phenomenon, uh, which rose uh, to heights that hadn't been seen since before the pandemic. People are interested in experiences, I think. Uh, I think that plays out in the data. You also see it in restaurant data. And they're interested in making up for lost time. And whether that strains them financially, they're still going to do it. Now, you know, uh, you can only sort of keep yourself in the air like Wile E. Coyote without looking below for so long before you literally don't have the money to handle it. Um, but I, I do think there is sort of a mass fear of missing out, like a mass FOMO going on uh, over the last year in the economy. And it has uh, been one of the reasons why consumer spending has kept up. Yeah. And do you think that can continue or do you think, you know, savings are being depleted rapidly? You're seeing credit card spend yeah. go up. Are you worried about this FOMO ending? I mean, I think you should be worried about it. I mean, fortunately, uh, inflation has moderated to a certain degree. And so that's, I don't think we, we've turned around into deflation or anything. We're still seeing much higher prices than we saw in 2020 or 2021. Um, but the fact that they are, are not continuing to spike at the rates that we saw over the past couple of years I think is a little bit helpful to people's budgets. Um, we are seeing wage increases, at least at the low end, that are keeping up or even exceeding price increases. So uh, people have a little bit more breathing room there. But there are all these other factors that are coming in, whether it's the resumption of student loan payments, which is a constraint for you know upwards of 40 million Americans, uh, uh, or whether it's, uh, you know, other things that are, that are happening, um, uh, combined with the fact that, that savings have started to really, uh, hit sort of scrape the bottom. I, I think there is a lot of difficulty and it can explain maybe some of the anxiety that, uh, shows up in the statistics when you see people talking about the economy. Yeah. Like consumer sentiment is cratering. Like nobody feels... Yeah. Very good about anything. And I feel like um, what you're talking about with FOMO spending, it reminds me a little bit of financial nihilism where people are like, well, I'm never going to retire, so I'm just going to hmm. spend all my money now. Um, do you think that sort of nihilism shows up in how people think about politics as well? It's kind of like, oh, we can't even find a speaker. Like, why would I get involved? Why would I even pay attention to this? Well, I mean, I think that uh that has been sort of an undercurrent for several years. I mean, this idea that uh, I, as one person, can't have an impact on politics, uh, that that I am not, uh, I'm just going to disengage because it's too horrible. I mean, we saw that a lot through the Trump years and, and certainly uh, uh, going on to today. But there's a, a good old saying that uh, I like to use as sort of a riposte to this. And, and the idea is that you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Uh, you it, <laughs> these forces are going to take place and they're going to affect your life, whether you like it or not. And so, uh, you know, 
we don't know what getting involved can do, but we certainly know what not getting involved can do. And that's you sort of give over to these forces. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think that that sort of whether you want to call it nihilism or alienation or disengagement has been you just look at the polling, you definitely see that that as as a factor. Um, but, uh, you know, you could look at that on the flip side and the fact that uh, 2020 was uh, one of the highest turnout presidential elections that we've seen in decades. 2018 was one of the highest midterm turnouts that we've seen in decades. Um, uh, people, you know, uh, they talk about sort of negative partisanship as being a real engagement tool. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, people are more engaged, or at least were uh, in, in the Trump years. And, you know, he's going to be on the ballot next year in all likelihood. And uh, I think we'll continue to see that, uh, that dynamic. Yeah. And it's um, interesting because, you know, Biden has done a pretty good job with the economy. But if you look on either side of the aisle, like there's this narrative that the economy is still really bad. And so going into 2024, how do you think that the two parties are going to talk about the economy and how will that shape how voters see it? Well, certainly uh, Republicans are going to focus on inflation, even if the inflation statistics are pretty moderate at that time. They're going to focus on it. They think it's a winning issue. Uh, the Democrats are going to focus on the fact that jobs are, uh, you know, I believe millions over 10 million have been created under Biden's presidency, that uh, the unemployment rate is at historic lows, that the, uh, the, the, the gap between the black and white unemployment rate is at historic lows. Uh, there are a number of things that I think Democrats will point to. Um, uh, it's it's a you know I, I think this has been uh, a, a something that's been present uh, for a while. Um, uh, uh, I, I, there is a problem with touting the economy too much when people's circumstances don't feel like that they're in the same place. Um, you know, it, it seems uh, I, I don't know if I would say demeaning, but it seems like it sort of erases people's experience to a certain degree. And uh, so Democrats sort of, as the party in power, have to walk that line uh, of not saying that we're denying that people uh, out there are hurting, but also that uh, there are you know, signs of recovery. Um, the other thing that Democrats like to point out is, and, and it's true, is that if you look at most industrialized nations, Democrats have had the, or the U.S. has had the best recovery from the pandemic. Um, however, you know, people live in the U.S. They don't live in Germany. They don't, they, I, you know, sort of arguing from international experience sometimes can be difficult uh, with respect to uh, when people are thinking about their own economic situation. But so uh, I think Democrats have a bit of a challenge. Uh, Republicans also have a challenge because they're talking about something that is, you know, a couple of years in the past. Um, it obviously depends on where gas prices end up and where other things end up uh, uh, when we're getting around the election time next year. But, you know, as as we're going now, it does seem like inflation is moderated and there hasn't been sort of the recession that some economists said was was necessary for inflation to moderate. Uh, and so Republicans are pl uh, might be singing off a script that is a little outdated. Yeah, um, Bloomberg published this piece in October 2022, saying that there was a 100 percent chance of recession by the end of 2022. And so how important do you think the media is in helping people? You know, like, obviously, it's very confusing. Republicans are going to say one thing. Democrats are going to say the other. Yeah. But, you know, as a journalist, like, what is the role of media in helping people out? with all of this? And how do you personally think about that? Right. I mean, I think you just have to sort of try to be as accurate as possible. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly written about the economy long enough to know that you could probably, if you have an opinion, you could probably find some st set of statistics that <laughs> justifies it in some way or another. But you have to look at sort of the totality of the experience. Um, and you know, uh, it's it's important to balance sort of the idea of the economy just being about employment statistics 
with the idea of the economy being, you know, as much about prices and uh, and things of that nature. And then, you know, trying to accurately judge who's responsible for that. I mean, obviously, uh, the Republican position is that the reason that we had inflation in 2021 and, and some 2022, it was entirely because of runaway spending uh, from from the administration. Uh, that, that, in my view, doesn't match with the actual reasons for it, uh, a lot of which have to do with, you know, sort of mismatches during the pandemic, supply chain issues, um, and even, you know, concentration in the economy where uh, there's, uh, you know, a, a concept called excuseflation, where um, uh, because these corporations that have, you know, enough market share to dictate their, their, their price levels, uh, because there was this undercurrent of talk about inflation, they felt uh, protected uh, and insulated from any kind of consumer pushback to continue to raise prices. And, uh, you know, certainly we saw that in earnings reports uh, for years uh, uh, prior to, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of move back on inflation. So, um, you know, I think it's just important to be accurate. Uh, obviously, media reports do play a role. Um, partisanship plays a role. We've all seen the statistics where, uh, or polling data, where uh, you ask people the, their opinions on the economy, and as soon as there's a changeover in power in Washington, those opinions completely flip. Uh, Democrats who said uh, the economy was bad now say it's good and vice versa. Um, so, uh, it's difficult to, to, to navigate this. And so I think there's a certain responsibility on the part of myself and other, other colleagues of mine in the media to, to really try to get it right. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult too, because sometimes it can feel like Americans almost choose the wrong path. And this is a very general and broad question, but I'm curious, like how you think American individualism shapes how Americans interact with the economy, interact with media, interact with politics. Like sometimes it feels like they make bad decisions almost on purpose. <laughs> um, I mean, certainly we have that tradition, right, of, uh, of uh, DIY, I guess, of uh, uh, individualism. Um, you know, uh, I think I think I would talk maybe more about the fragmentation of uh, media over the last 50 years, um, first by cable, which you know brought us away from the three big networks, then by uh, you know the, the proliferation online, and then finally by social media, uh, which now itself has become more fragmented because of changes to various uh, models like like Twitter slash X. Um, uh, now, you know, for me, trying to just sort of get people to read my stuff, I'm posting in several different places, uh, trying to find those audiences. So you can really narrow cast yourself into, uh, you know, one sort of way of looking at the world. Uh, this isn't entirely different or novel in our history. I mean, papers were extremely partisan. Uh, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, basically, um, and uh, you could you could customize your experience of, of of your you know what communication you were getting certainly throughout that period. So I, I don't want to say that things are entirely different now, um, but uh, it's certainly much easier to only hear from people you assume you agree with and to block out any other sort of competing thoughts. Um, so I, that's, that's certainly problematic for, uh, you know, the truth. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something I try to catch myself from and certainly try to read other forms of, of, of opinion uh, and, and see what else is out there. And I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't think it should be the case where, you know, People have this homework to do where they have to check every source themselves and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, go on this personal journey of, of balancing their, their media intake. But, um, you know, I, I do think that, that people should be more, more aware of, uh, you know, the, the, the bubbles that they've, they've you know, allowed themselves to fall into. 
Yeah. And in your book, um, Chain of Title, you you know, you talk about this concept of foreclosure fatigue, where it's kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, people, um, it's just like, oh, they weren't actually kicked out. Like, we're just not going to worry about it because like everybody's kind of tired. And like, that's what the judges end up doing. It's just mm-hmm. saying like, we're not going to worry about it. Um, do you think that fatigue extends to media? Like people are just like, well, you know, like I'm just going to pay attention to my echo chamber because I'm just I'm just tired. Or is that like too big of a generalization to draw between the two? I think absolutely there was uh, fatigue. Uh, You know, we saw it definitely in the Trump years that uh, people, you know, decided to quit doom scrolling, quit paying attention to uh, a media that seemed to be bombarding them uh, uh, with, with, you know, scoop after scoop and, 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 and development after development. Um, you know, that hasn't necessarily slowed down a whole lot in the Biden years, um, even though Biden has sort of put himself on the outside of uh, of that entire cacophony. He's, he's tried to sort of uh, stay off to the side. And I think that actually has driven some of the narratives about him being sort of a, uh, a, a, an elderly, uh, 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 not figure with not a lot of dynamism. Uh, and it's a lot because of this conscious choice to stay out of the debates. Uh, so now there's this expectation has been sort of uh, fostered during the Trump years that the the role of a president is to be the center of attention. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, I mean, I think <laughs> that uh, definitely there is media fatigue, uh, uh, you know, certainly uh Post Trump, we did see every every media organization you could ask saw a drop in uh, their their coverage and in, in their um, in their traffic. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think I think the role of a media organization that recognizes the reality of that has to be to uh rid oneself of the stories that don't really matter and to focus on the stories that that do. And that's what we try to do with the prospect. Um, We don't, you know, run stories about what somebody tweeted. We don't run stories about he said, he said, she said, we don't run stories about horse race politics too much. Um, We try to, to get involved in, you know, who has power and what they're doing with it and uh, how, how people, real people are affected. And uh, I think those stories, it, it's hard to, I mean, maybe it, you can be fatigued by those stories, but as I said before, like they're gonna, you know, this, this power is gonna be wielded upon you, whether you like it or not. So you better be informed about it. Yeah, um, and when I was prepping for this interview, uh, one question that I wrote down that I wanted to ask you was, mm-hmm. "How do you create change in a system that is resistant to it?" But now, as we're talking, I feel like that's not the right phrasing. It's almost like, "How do you show the system that the change needs to happen?" And like you've written a lot about that, like monopolized one example mm-hmm. of like, "How do we get regulation back to reality?" Um, so, how do you think that we do that? Like, it's not necessarily that people are resistant to change, but like, how do you introduce them right. to that concept? I mean, uh I don't know that it's necessarily my role to make that change. There's a role for activists and there's a role for journalists. And uh, I feel like my role is to uh, see my journalism as a tool. Uh, That tool can then be picked up by activists in in whatever way they choose to use it to to forward uh, their particular uh, piece of advocacy. Um, I, I think that you know one of the things that we try to do is explain to people that there are options i mean sometimes it just feels like you know uh we have this uh bought off uh political system we have this regulatory capture and there's no real option for uh you know regular people to be represented in that debate and i I don't think that's entirely true and uh i think that you know, one of our roles is to say, no, actually, there's a way to get involved. There's a way to get this thing done. This looks like a roadblock, but it's not actually a roadblock. It's being presented that way so that, uh, you know, powerful forces can uh, get their way. And so I think that is an important 
tool for activism, an important tool for change, is to uh, you know not present uh, uh, what happens in Washington as a sort of fait accompli, but to present it as as uh, something that's that's flexible and changeable and uh, sub, you know susceptible to pressure and susceptible to uh, different alternatives. Hmm. And we talked a lot about, you know, the emotions of the economy, the emotions of politics, but I'm curious, like, as a writer, and you've been writing for a while, like, um, how do you maintain hope and like, keep on, ad not advocating, right, but like, keep on writing these things for other people to take and go forth? Well, I mean, like I said, I just think they're important. I, I, I think that uh, it's it's very easy to be cynical and disengage um, and to have sort of the same answer for everything that, uh, oh, what, uh, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the worst thing on social media when you write a story is you get this reply from uh, some very random person that says, oh, are you surprised by that? <laughs> um, and and. You know, we uh, as as writers just really hate that because um, it it shows this sort of uh, cynical, all knowing view of the world that uh, I feel, first of all, isn't accurate, and second of all, is this sort of learned helplessness. Um, uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, ordinary people are up against incredibly powerful forces. Um, from corporate America, from people trying to maintain their power in government, et cetera. Um, it, is no, it, it is never an easy task to uh, get people who have power to willingly give up some of that power. And yet it happens. It happens all the time. And uh, so uh, I feel like, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it necessarily hope, but I think that there is... Uh, you know, I feel like my work continues to be valuable uh, because I am presenting these opportunities for uh, for for change and and these opportunities for uh, uh, you know the dynamics that usually happen in in Washington to not happen. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, I I think that. You know, the work is critical because it's critical. I mean, maybe that's uh, kind of a silly, you know, like like sort of a, a tautology, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it continues to be true to me. Yeah. And going back to the, you know, the comments, right? Like, so people say all sorts of stuff, um, but sometimes the comments are, are kind. Um, mm -hmm. Has there been somebody who's been like supportive to you recently or like has given you a good idea just from the comments alone? Or do you check them that often? Oh, I check them all the time. I mean, I, I think anyone who wants feedback on their work is going to seek it out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that I'm always heartened when somebody gets something out of the work that I do. Um, you know, I've, I've written stories. Uh, there's one particular story I'm thinking about I wrote years ago where I still get letters of, about it uh, and about, uh, you know, different aspects of it. Um, so, uh, you know, any kind of feedback for me, even negative feedback, it can be good. I mean, if if it you know forces you to look at something in a different way or think about the way that you phrase something or uh, you know anything like that. I mean, some of it you know obviously is is just just uh, uh, pure hate, I guess. But um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I I think that it's important for writers to remain engaged with the public for whom they write. Do not put yourself in an ivory tower. Do not assume like, oh, how dare that person uh, criticize my work. Uh, take it seriously um, and uh, learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest thing is like being able to learn from everything, pull pull bits and feedback out. Um, so I know that you recently published the How to Be a Billionaire um, piece. And sure. I'm curious, like, uh, you know, this will be the last question, but like, mm -hmm. I'm curious, what's the big thing that you're thinking about right now? Like, obviously that was a huge piece. It's unreal that's happening, but like, what's <laughs> another big thing or is that the big thing that you're focused on right now? I mean, there, there are so many <laughs> uh, big issues in the world right now from uh, the situation in Israel to uh, the, the, the never ending quest for a speaker <laughs> um, yeah, and every, and everything that, 
follows from that. I mean, there's just this huge amount of backlog of, of material that Congress has to deal with uh, once there, somebody actually is empowered to, to deal with it. So, um, and obviously the election is, is uh, the election next year. I mean, there is actually an election in two weeks uh, with a lot of pretty important things on the ballot, uh, 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 future of reproductive rights in Ohio, probably in Virginia, given how, uh, depending on how the legislative races shape out there. Um, there's an interesting race in Mississippi for governor where the Republican you think would romp is, is having some trouble pulling, pulling away. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that in my position, you kind of have to look at the entire picture um, and be, uh, you know, uh, willing to change course uh, when when circumstances arise. I didn't even mention that, you know, we have ongoing the biggest monopolization trial in the last 25 years, uh, U.S. versus Google. Um, very focused on that case uh, and other cases that are coming down the pike uh, in this new aggressiveness from the antitrust authorities to uh, dial back corporate power uh, a little bit. Obviously, it was a focus of the book I wrote in 2020. So uh, this is an, a really exciting moment in that uh, uh, in that context of seeing whether we're going to have a government that really uh, uh, you know takes on monopolies, uh, tries to uh, put the public interest first of the interest of giant corporations. So uh, there's just a lot going on. Yeah, no, that's uh, definitely for sure. Where can people find all your work? Sure. So uh, it's prospect.org. Uh, that's uh, our website. It's no paywall. It's uh, available daily. Um, we have a magazine that we put out six times a year that you can you can figure out how to get uh, if you go to prospect.org. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm on, uh, still on X plugging away at, uh, D day and D D a Y E N, uh, also on blue sky, uh, mm. as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. This has been great. All right. Thank you.